Eh, tusen, tusen takk for at jeg fikk eh, lov å komme over Nordsjøen. Jeg, jeg kommer til å ha presentasjonen på engelsk, eh, fordi islandsken min er litt for dårlig. Jeg håper det går greit eh, for dere. Eh, just a question first. Uh, those of you who are board members of a sport club, can you raise your hand? That's very good. I, I have some assignments for you to do after this <laughs> presentation. Those of you who are coaches in, in a sport club, raise your hand. That's good. Uh, is there any representatives from national federations in the room? That's very good. I have some detailed rec <laughs> recommendations for you. Uh, the aim of my presentation now, the next 25 minutes, the aim is to tell you what you can do in your sport club, in your federation, in your coach situation as a coach. And, and not only that, I will tell you what you should do. <laughs> and I hope that you will do uh, some of the things that I tell you now. Of course, in your own way and adapted to your situation, etc. But you cannot listen to all you've heard so far and do nothing. That is wrong. But the problem at a topic like this is that when you want to do something, you might find it difficult to do something because you don't really know what to do. Huh? I want to do something about this, but I'm insecure, I'm afraid. Can I do this? Can I do that? Will people be in against me if I put up the issue? Will they misunderstand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? My aim is to get that fear a little bit lower after the next 20 minutes. We'll see. First, why do the Norwegian Olympic and Paralympic Committee and Confederation of Sport, the Norwegian equi equivalent of the SIS, why do we work on this topic? We work on this topic because we have a vision that demands us to do something. Because the vision is joy of sport for all. And when you have sexual harassment or abuse in your, uh, in your sport, in your sport situation, you do not fulfill this vision. So when we work on this topic, we're telling our member federation and member clubs that we don't work on this topic because we are a specific organization on this topic. We work on this topic because it's core business. If we don't work on this, we are not fulfilling our vision. Um, and then we put it in our policy documents. And one of the very important tools for me when I'm working with this as an advisor, I need to have backing in the policy documents. Because if someone says, oh, do we have to prioritize this? You know, Hover, there are so many important things in sport. Do we have to work on this topic as well? I have to show them, well, we have made a commitment. And in our sport policy document, it's written that we shall ensure zero tolerance for any form of discrimination and harassment. Zero tolerance is a very nice term. <clears throat> I don't know how it is here in Iceland, but in Norway, politicians like zero tolerance. Uh, very strong. We have zero tolerance for drug, and we have zero tolerance for alcohol, zero tolerance for crime, and zero tolerance. It, it, it sounds very, very strong. You, know? you can win elections by saying zero tolerance. But there was this occasion in Norway. Um, a Norwegian member of parliament had been taken by the police because he had used drugs. Uh, it was quite embarrassing. Uh, and the head of the parliament group was asked sort of about this, and the, the, the journalist says, so, what, is, um, what, what are you thinking and doing about this situation? And the, and the politician said that, in our party, we have zero tolerance for drug abuse. And then the follow-up question came, but what will the consequence of zero tolerance be for the name of the member of parliament? And as politicians sometimes do, the representative of the party group looked up, looked down again, and repeated what he had already said. We have zero tolerance for. <laughs> When I'm out there in a sport club or in a federation, I have to tell them, what do we mean by zero tolerance? And this is the recommendation from the Olympic Committee. Zero tolerance doesn't mean that if you do a small little mistake, you're kicked out of sport forever. But zero tolerance means there shall always be a reaction. And on this field, sexual harassment and abuse, there is an enormous spectrum. You have heard stories earlier today and in those stories, the reaction should be that a person is kicked out of sport and never allowed to return. That is a suitable reaction in some of the cases. 
But let's say in the other end of the spectrum, if you as a coach, you're, let's say you're an archery coach, you know archery? Yeah. You're an archery coach and your athlete, you want to help your athlete, so you, you hold around your athlete to show the athlete where to, to hold the arm. And the athlete is really disliking that and consider that sexual harassment. And as I'm going to show you afterwards, the athlete is then right, because it's the athletes defining what is sexual harassment and not you as a coach. But you've done the same thing that you've done to many, many athletes over many, many years. Should you be punished for that? Where is the zero tolerance? And our recommendation is there shall be a reaction. But the reaction in that case might be that you as a coach is told that you shall not do that touching to that athlete. And you should be aware that there might be other athletes who find this way of touching uncomfortable, but they might not have had the courage to tell you because you're the coach and you're not supposed to tell a coach not to do something. Is this relevant for your club? That's a big question. Because in the beginning when you start to discuss this topic, the leaders in your club or in the sport federation might think, we don't want people at ice, in Iceland to think that there are abuse in sport. Because you know what can happen then? That the parents will not let their children go to the sport. Or the person, the leaders of the football federation are think that we don't want to say that it is in football. Because then parents will take the kids out of football and into other sports. And the other federations are thinking the same. But it comes down to, is this relevant for your club? This is our answer. This is from a, a newspaper article in the biggest Norwegian newspaper, January one year ago. And our message from the Olympic Committee is, every sport club must work on this topic. It's relevant for every sport club, because in your club, either this has happened, or it happens now without you knowing, or it will happen. Either it has happened in your club, or it happens now, or it will happen, or two or three of them all together. The fact that you don't know about abuse or harassment situation in your club is most likely because your club has not dealt with this topic in a proper way, that the athletes in your club don't have trust in you reacting in a good way if they will tell you what they have experienced. This is relevant for all clubs. I speak with the clubs in Norway that got cases. So when, like, like in August, the uh, president of a club, he calls me, and he said they have a problem, <laughs> he needs help. Because like the, the, the you know, the, the person who has run this club more or less alone for many, many years, now there is an abuse case, allegations against this, this old leader in the club. And then they, they don't know what to do, and they need help. If you have had the thought in your head that this can happen in my club, if you have done some of the measures that I will show you in the very last, or next to very last slide, then your life will be easier. The life in the club will be easier. The situation for the athletes and the parents in the club will be not totally fine, because you cannot get it totally fine, but it will be easier. If you don't address this topic, and something happens in your club or in your federation, and you know with yourself, I was at this seminar, in 2019, and I did nothing, then you are co-responsible for the things that happens afterwards. And it doesn't look nice. So if I talk to a president of the federation that wants to look good, you know, some politicians also in sport, they want to appear good. They have made good decisions, seem very wise, and etc. And I tell them, if you want to look good, you better do what I ask you to do. Because I know some stories that can happen in your club in your federation, and if you have not done what I tell you to do, you will not look good. If you do what I tell you to do, you will not look perfect, but it will be much, much easier. And here's another point. You cannot be neutral. This is a topic where you cannot be neutral. I have many cases where the, the leader of the club calls me and he said, he or she said, you know, we have this allegation, and I, I don't know, because I know this coach, and I've known him for many years, and I don't think that he could have done the thing that, that this athlete has said it is done. And, and I want to be objective. I want to, I want to avoid making a prejudgment. And I say, you cannot, be a, you, you cannot be neutral to this. 
either you follow up every report as it is a reality, or you fail. In the moment you think that you can decide whether this has happened or not, you fail. And I used to tell board members of clubs where they don't want to take explicit measures, I tell them, well, you, don't know, you cannot know for sure whether there was a rape in this case, because the, person is not, the coach is not convicted in court. So you cannot say, I mean, you don't know. But you know that something has happened because you've got this story from the athlete. I'm telling you, your decision now, bear in mind, if five years from now, this coach is convicted for rape in your sport club, the biggest newspaper is asking you, why didn't you do more five years ago? Think about that front page. And think about whether you want to be in the top of that front page as the leader of the club that allowed the coach to continue. So instead of thinking the worst, the worst thing that can happen here is that I'm, not getting, that I'm getting this popular <laughs> amongst the coaches. No, the worst thing is that you are responsible for another abuse, another harassment. You cannot be neutral. OK, from now on, I'm going to go a little bit faster. This was the, the more calm section. Now it's speeding up. <laughs> this is the timeline. In 2000, we got research that showed that one out of four uh, female athletes at top level had experienced sexual harassment in the sport. Interesting thing from this study is that there wasn't a higher um, rate of people that had experienced abuse amongst those that had been in sport and those that had been out of sport. Just as it was said earlier today, said, it happens everywhere. You know? It happens also in sport. In 2000, we got our first guidelines against sexual harassment. It's not a coincidence. We got the first research, and then the first guidelines get some research on this topic. Because when you argue with the, well, sometimes it's like older men, men a little bit older than me in the Federation, and they don't want to do something, this research is very good to have. I mean, so get some research. In 2009, we started to require police checks, police certificates for those with responsibility for children or people with intellectual disabilities. 2010, we got the revised guidelines. I'm going to go through them for you now in a minute. 2011, we got a dedicated staff member. <clears throat> That's me. <laughs> so someone in the secretariat that had as a responsibility to follow up on this dossier. So there was, it was one person that a sport organization could call. And from that on, amongst other, I have uh, trainings with the people at the front desk, the people who takes the phone, so that they know that if someone is calling the Olympic Committee and is crying in the phone, they are put to me. If that someone is afraid of what to say, that they are met in a good way. And we try to distribute information saying that, well, there is someone you can call for help. Because when a sport leader hears about a story like this, they need help. This is not something you're trained to deal with as a sport leader. It's not a part of the, of the, it's not a part of the original dossier. So. so you need help from someone. 2013, we made five films that I'm going to show you afterwards. And 2017, we got a guide for dealing with cases that I will show you also. This is the guidelines. The first guideline, and guidelines, that's the rules. The rules that if you break these guidelines, we might sanction reactions within sport. The first guideline is, treat everyone with respect and refrain from all forms of communication, action, or behavior that may be perceived as offensive. Now I want you, if you know that you have never broken the first guideline, by will or by accident, if you're sure that you've never broken it, can you raise your hand now? And I used to say that if there are too many raising their hand, we need a, a, a training course in self-understanding. Uh, self <laughs> My point being that these guidelines are easy to break. And that is by intent. Because we don't want to have a discussion, was the guideline broken or not? What is a breach of the rule or not? If someone comes forward with a complaint, it is, as a basis point, a breachment of the rule, unless you can explicitly prove that it's false presented. So unless someone says that I committed harassment when I actually was here in Reykjavik having a presentation to you, but if, uh, unless I have like a, a proof like that that it didn't happen, well, you deal with it as a, break, a breachment of the rule. And 
it is not your intention that defines whether it was a breach of the rules or not. Because you can harass without intending to harass. It's quite easy, and it happens a lot. And if we don't manage to deal with these small, well, that can be really grave for the people who experience it, but if we cannot deal with the mild harassments, it will be much difficult, more difficult for us to deal with the very, very grave abuse cases. So we say that it is the effect that decides whether it is a breaking of the rules. And who defines? Well, the person that has experienced it. So avoid body contact that may be perceived as unwanted. That is a risk situation. We have made these guidelines to deal with risk situations. So that instead of having a rule saying, uh, avoid body contact that was sexually and negative intended, that most likely not even those who did it would like to admit that they did it. We said that we avoid body contact that may be perceived as unwanted. So if you as a coach is touching or uh, you're touching your athlete in a way that the athletes dislike, this can get a reaction for you, regardless of whether your intent wasn't any negative. Avoid all types of verbal intimacy that may be perceived as sexually charged. Avoid expression, jokes, and opinions that relate to the athlete's gender or sexual orientation in a negative way. We haven't spoken so much about the LGBT here, but homophobia is sexual harassment. Homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, it's sexual harassment. The IOC defines it as sexual harassment. And then it should be defined as sexual harassment in sport clubs in Iceland as well. And it should be reacted to. And I've worked on this area as well, and I know that it's difficult. But I have to say, for those of you who know the, the music video of Sigurd Roos, uh, what's the name of the... No, you don't have to... It's a, the title where you have, um, okay, there is a music video. <laughs> I, I don't remember, it's a little bit difficult remembering the Icelandic music video names when they are in Icelandic. There is a music video about a story that I've used when I've addressed LGBT issues in, um, in Norway. Uh, and outside here, if you can read Norwegian, I brought with me a couple of these magazines that we made in 2011, 2012, about homophobia in sport. And also outside, you can find the guidelines that I'm going through now in English. Seek to have both sexes represented in the support network. That's not because women are born nicer than men. They are not. But it's because if you have a, if you have a group where you have both men and women, Usually you avoid some of the negative environments that you have. And those negative environments, uh, sometimes called locker room talk, <laughs> you have that among men a lot in sport, but you have that also among women. So to have both sexes represented is reducing the risk. Avoid contact with athletes in private spaces unless there are several persons present or in agreement with parents, guardians, or the sport management. Most of the abuse allegations are about when the athlete and the coach were alone. And usually it's allegations that cannot be proven or are extremely difficult to prove. So the athletes say there was an abuse happening. The coach say, no, there was nothing happening. And if it goes to the court, the legal system, they might say there are not enough proof here. So we, how do we deal with this risk situation? We do it the way that we say, don't be alone with your athlete. And if I get a case on my table where an athlete has accused a coach for rape, happening in a situation where the coach and the athlete were alone, I tell the club, this is a clear violation of point number six in the guidelines, and I recommend you to take this coach out of service. You cannot say that the coach has committed the rape, but you can say that the, the coach has broken the guideline number six, and you need guidelines that you can follow up and punish on the basis of, give reaction on the basis of, without having to needing a proof of, um, um, a, proof of, a, of a crime. And the same at the, the next one. <clears throat> Show respect for the athletes, coaches, and leaders' private life. This is the closest we get to a social media point, because guidelines were made in 2010. We're revising them now, so we get a little bit more on social media. Avoid dual relationships. If a reciprocal relationship is established, the situation should be raised and clarified openly in the milieu. We're talking here about love relations or sexual relations between athletes and coaches. And we see now that this wording 
is too weak. Because if you have guidelines, you need to be explicit. Don't talk about sex without mentioning it. Because you risk that people don't understand. Maybe because they don't understand, and maybe because they don't want to understand. You know? If you want to avoid sexual relations between coach and athlete, write that. So this is our revised. This will be in the, in the next uh, guidelines when we just revise them. And we work to get this into the coach contract. Coaches shall, in general, not engage in amorous or sexual relations with any of their athletes. And if it happens, I have friends that are married to their coach. If it happens, the coach shall immediately inform his or her superior in order for the latter to decide if the relation shall have consequences for the coach. Because if you have a classic rape situation, athlete invited home to the coach, they drank some wine, they had sex. The athlete says afterwards, that was rape. The coach said, no, 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 no. It was just consensual sex between two, uh, two people over 18. Then we can use that. And then we can say, uh, Mr. Coach or Mrs. Coach, did you inform your superior about that sexual relationship with your athlete? And when they say no, because usually they don't talk about this, if they say no, you can say, well, you have broken the contract. We don't need to speak to your lawyer. We can tell you now that you're not anymore a coach in this club. But you need to inform the coach. Because coaches need to know what are the framework and the conditions. And therefore, I recommend spell it out. Say no sex with athletes. So that the coaches also know that there are rules that can have consequences. Do not offer any form of reward with the purpose of demanding or anticipating sexual services in return. And Everybody has a responsibility to take action and give notice if a breach of these rules is experienced. And no one shall be punished for telling about the suspicion. No one shall be punished for telling about the suspicion. And we are very strong. Our recommendation is that if someone tries to, to punish someone for bringing forward a suspicion, that is a case in the sport court. <laughs> because in need. You, if I have, I have two children, uh, a girl at two and a boy at four. And we have a child security system in, in Norway. And I know that if someone reported me to the child security system saying that they were unsure whether I mistreated, maltreated my children in such a way that my sh children should be taken away from me, it wouldn't be nice. I wouldn't like it. I wouldn't enjoy it. But in one way, I would have to be in favor of it because it meant that someone that was in doubt that was unsure, instead of not saying anything, they reported it. And those systems and, and topics like this, they don't work if you only report what is abuse. Because then you will have a lot of things that should have been reported that aren't reported. So it's better to report more than what is real abuse and harassment than to report less. The key challenge here is fear and insecurity. Um, and I will now go very fast, or even faster than before. Those of you who would like to see the guide, this one, it was uh, distributed outside, it's empty now. Those of you who would like to go through this more in details, which tells what is our recommendation for sport clubs in Norway and how to deal with cases, step by step. Wake up tomorrow before 10 and come to Laugardalur, <laughs> where there is a workshop. Who of you are coming to the workshops tomorrow? Raise your hand. Aha! And for those of you who haven't planned yet, <laughs> I'd like to meet you there. Karen and Mike and me is going to have one of the workshops. Um, we want people to overcome the fear of dealing with cases. Then it's needed to have clear-cut advice, step-by-step -step recommendations, and someone to call for help. That's why we made a guide that we will present tomorrow. Um, here it is. That was a very, very quick look. <laughs> if, you didn't, if you didn't get this paper and if you're not coming tomorrow, you can send me an email. My email will be at the last slide and ask me to send it to you. I will send it to you. Then we want to um, reduce the fear for the taboo. How can you address this in a sport club? And we made some films showing situations. Can you stop that? Concentrate. Physical contact with an athlete during training, what is appropriate? We made them with uh, English and French subtitles. And if you haven't used them or know about them, you can use them because they are ba -ba 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 -ba, available in Icelandic with Icelandic subtitles. 
at this web page provided by the SIS. So you can use them. The aim with these films is that in a sport club, you have a coach meeting, you just press push on the film, and then you ask the coach, what do you think? And then the first step is done. You have discussed this topic with your coaches without you or any other board member afraid of talking about this topic. You don't have to say anything. You just show the film. National Federation and Sport Clubs, we've done research, and to put it short, if you do a good job on gender equality, you're more likely to do a good job on sexual harassment and abuse. Among those who work actively to make the guidelines on sexual harassment and abuse known in the organization, if gender equality was a topic in coach education, it was almost double as much likely that they addressed the topic of sexual harassment and abuse. And if more than 50% the, uh, of the board members were women, there were 75% a chance. This is not because women are good. This is, this is because men are bad. Not everybody, but too many. Men are afraid of this topic. Men are afraid that people might think ill about them if they address this topic. We need more men to talk about this topic, and you need to make alliances in your club so you ensure that this is not a women thing. It's a women and men thing. But you can also say that if you don't work on gender equality in the club, it will be a higher risk for abuse in the club. This is, uh, you can see this when you get a presentation sent out afterwards. I will leave it, leave it here. We actually give more money to the national federations that work on this topic. You get 423,000 Icelandic krona to your national federation if you do a medium, medium job. <laughs> and you get 846,000 Icelandic krona per federation if you do a good job. We have used that as a measure to make more federations bring this into coach education and do a proper job. Our recommendation to clubs are address the topic at coach meetings, mention the guidelines in coach contracts, make it easier to report by addressing the topic, have information on your web page, take all reports seriously and handle cases properly. And I tell to the club, what you can do is that you can take this document at the next board meeting, it's four pages bullet points. You can take this document at your next board meeting, and then you decide, we will deal with cases according to this document. <laughs> That's done. And then they appoint the case manager, a man and a woman in the board, who then will be responsible for dealing with a case that come up. Saves a lot of, a lot of energy when there is a case. So in the end, you cannot be neutral. Ah, uh, last point. You will risk having more cases if you do this. You will risk that more people report. We have seen an increase in number of cases in Norway. I get twice as many phone calls and emails about this topic this year than last year. That is not because there is more abuse. That is because there are less people who live with this abuse without telling. So I want the numbers to increase because it takes it up in the open and it makes life better for those involved. Yes, you will get an increase in cases, and that is really good, because we are going to fight for the joy of sport for all. Thank you so much.